you say? I don't want to say it. Just say Happy Father's Day. <laughs>to all nations online my name is hannah chow and i'm on staff here and we're so glad that you have joined us for worship today there's two things that have been made clear to me this year 2020 the first is that this world is broken no matter which way you look at it there is pain injustice and suffering it exists out in the world in the communities around us and even inside our own hearts the second thing that has been made clear to me is that without god there is no hope The problems are just too vast, too complicated, and too sinful for us humans to fix. So every day, I am grateful for an all-powerful God who has solved the problems of sin through the wonderful work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. I am so thankful that He hears our cries and then responds in His perfect timing with grace and truth. And so church, I hope you find hope in this great God as we enter into a time of call to worship. This is when we purposefully recenter our lives around a good God who hears us and loves us. Please follow along as I read the words from Psalm chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. This is the word of the Lord. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Amen. Church, let us spend a moment in prayer as we continue in this time of worship.
Church, let's sing this together. Come behold. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom
Our God is the giver of breath and of life. In Genesis, we read about how God breathes the breath of life into man. And yet so often when we breathe out, we don't breathe out praise to our God. Instead, we chase after other things in our lives, security, family, privilege, and these things become idols in our lives. And although we may no longer carve idols out of wood or precious metals, these idols are clearly visible to God. And he wants to remove them from our hearts because he knows that they will never satisfy us and they keep us from seeking after him. So as we enter into a time of confession of sin, let us read Psalm chapter 135 verses 15 through 18 to remind us of the pervasiveness and danger of idols which reside inside our hearts. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, They have eyes but do not see, they have ears but do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. Perhaps the pandemic and the unrest of our days have revealed to you idols in your hearts that you didn't even know existed. Let us take this time now to confess all these idols to God so that we do not become lifeless and breathless like these idols. Let us pray.
And now, church, would you receive the assurance of pardon from Jesus himself, who spoke these words to his disciples after his resurrection. This is the word of the Lord from John chapter 30, verses 21 through 22. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Church, Jesus has breathed new life into us. He has given us the Holy Spirit to live within us so that he can do his mighty work of removing idols from our lives. We do not deserve it. We cannot earn it. But God in his love and mercy has made a way for us to breathe out praises to him. And let us do just that as we sing the song of renewal together. What gift of love could I offer to a king? What weight or worth could be held in thin my offering? When he alone is worthy A glory song is inscribed upon my heart This treasure held in an alabaster I pray to bring him all the glory. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures.
Dear God, as we celebrate fathers today, we thank you for the sacrifices they make and the love that they have for us. I pray that you would continue to help them lead their families into faith with humility and love. For those who have difficult relationships with their fathers, we pray that you would help them take steps to show grace and forgiveness. For those who are missing their fathers, we pray that you would comfort them and heal their hearts. Lord, we thank you that you are our perfect Heavenly Father. Would we look to you so we can show the same grace you give us to our imperfect fathers. Thank you for adopting us into your family through the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus has already saved us from our sins, but we confess that we still fall. Remind us that no matter how hopeless we may feel, we're never beyond your saving grace. Thank you for being our ultimate source of hope during these uncertain times. I pray that we would fight against being complacent and pray for this broken world. It's hard for some of us to believe this right now, but help us to fully trust that you will ultimately bring justice. We pray that you'd use this time to spread the gospel to the nations. Give us believers the heart to share with others what Jesus has given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, and thank you again for joining us online for worship. We're continuing our series through the parables, and today we're going to look at a parable that has confused a lot of people for a long period of time. It's the parable of the persistent widow and the unrighteous judge. It's one of those parables in the Bible that we read and we don't understand, so we just pass it over and and keep on reading. Another parable like that is the parable of the fig tree. We don't understand why Jesus cursed the fig tree, and then we, um, we just keep moving. We keep moving for a more accessible passage of scripture uh, for our daily devotion. But as I was preparing this message, I, I smiled and I laughed with our staff because uh, God's timing was so perfect for us yet again. Uh, this passage was selected for this Sunday months in advance, but God in his sovereign grace, he knew that this was a word that we needed for today, for our present context. This parable is about how, G, uh, how Christians are called to respond to injustice, how we are called to respond to injustice through prayer. It's a word of encouragement from Jesus for us not to lose heart during difficult times, but to be, remain steadfast in prayer as we face, as we experience, as we witness injustice in this world. So please turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 9. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 9. I'll be, re- I'll be reading from the ESV, and may God bless the reading of his holy and inspired word. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Amen. This parable is about petitionary prayer. Now, that's not a phrase we hear too often, but it's something we do regularly. We actually do it regularly. When we go before God and ask for help, we are petitioning. When we pray for God to intervene and to change the state of affairs in our lives, in our church, in our communities, in the world, we are asking God uh, through petition. We are petitioning God in prayer. When we pray for justice, and vindication, we are making an appeal of petition before him. And Jesus uses the imagery of a courtroom between a powerless widow 
and an unrighteous, powerful judge to describe petitionary prayer. Now, in our society, there's a lot of petitioning going on today. It's a form of activism to promote change and social reform. And this has been practiced in our country throughout our history. It's a First Amendment right. And so someone will draft a position, a petition and get as many people as they can to sign it. And the more signatures that you have, the weightier and more relevant that petition becomes. The more influential, influential uh, that that petition is. Uh, the most popular online site for petition is a website called uh, change.org, change.org. Um, and as I was scrolling through the site, uh, there were countless petitions for justice. Justice, justice for Breonna Taylor. Justice for Ahmaud Arbery. Justice for George Floyd. And there were millions upon millions of signatures for these petitions. There were also a lot of petitions regarding education, right? Regarding education. So students and families were petitioning uh, their schools, their districts, their particular schools to change their grading policies in light of COVID-19. And so they were petitioning for uh, all of the grades to be pass, no pass this semester because of the difficulties and the complexities of online education. Um, and there was one petition I found in Florida, okay, uh, Florida, that was calling for all students to receive a passing grade for the semester. So not even pass, no pass. They were saying every student should pass every class regardless of their completed assignments, regardless of their scores, regardless of homework. They should all get a pass this semester because of COVID-19. Um, I know out of self-interest I would sign that petition. And I would get all of my friends, all of our parents to sign that petition. There were about 250,000 uh, signatures for that particular petition. And then there were some really trivial petitions as well. Uh, one that stood out was a petition to have Kobe Bryant become the new logo of the NBA. Right? Uh, that had over 3 million signatures. 3 million signatures to make Kobe Bryant the new logo of the NBA. Uh, another was to uh, keep Beyonce. Uh, off of the next Black Panther movie, okay? And so haters gonna hate, but they had 80,000 petitions to keep Beyonce off of the next Black Panther movie. And probably the silliest petition that I found uh, was a petition for the government and the president uh, to build a real Death Star for outer space, all right, for outer space. And so, uh, you know, the Death Star from, from Star Wars. And so these, these nerds wanted the, the real thing. And... Um, that only had like 25 signatures, and so I don't think that's going to happen. But who knows? Maybe our, our friends at JPL are secretly working on that. And I share those examples because I believe that these online petitions and the way that, that they're being uh, drafted and, and, and engaged with, uh, they actually reflect uh, the ways that many of us pray. Sometimes we pray out of genuine conviction while other times we pray out of self-interest. Sometimes we pray for the things that we truly need, that our families need, that our communities and our society truly needs. And other times we pray for the things we merely want. And in James, in the book of James in chapter four, James actually explains the misuse of petitionary prayer. Okay, he describes it and he describes why it doesn't work and how it can be abused uh, by Christians in the church. And he writes, you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. What if these verses are true? What if one of the main reasons we lack justice in our world is because Christians are not praying for it? What if we are praying, but we are doing it wrongly? We are wasting our breath out of selfish ambition and selfish passion. Whether our petitions and our priorities are more aligned with a specific tribe or specific group, rather than considering the heart of God and the truth of God for his people and for this world. Brothers and sisters, prayer is powerful. It is powerful. It is a weapon. And in the face of injustice, Jesus is calling his people to pray. 
to pray and not lose heart. So today, as we unpack this parable, I want us to consider three things. Three things. First, the nature of petitionary prayer. Second, the expression of it. And finally, its power. So the nature, the expression, and then the power of petitionary prayer. Now in verse 1, Jesus gives us the reason why he gives this, the disciples this parable. And he says very plainly, he wants them to pray continually and not lose heart. Jesus knows that his disciples, he knows that his followers will experience trials and hardship. He knows that his followers will experience injustice in this world, not only in the times of the early church, but all the way to our present day, that there will be injustice, there will be afflictions, there will be oppression and evil waged against the people of God. And this parable is designed to help us endure, to help his disciples endure, to help his church endure. He begins with a description of a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. This was a sign of the judge's wickedness. Okay? This is a true sign that this judge was not qualified to be a judge over God's people. In 2 Chronicles 19 verse 7, we actually have a description of a righteous judge, of the characteristics of what a judge should have. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, or partiality, or taking bribes. This was how Jehoshaphat, the king over Israel at that time, was to select judges. Men who feared the Lord. Men who knew that they would be accountable before a just God. Men who showed no partiality and would not take bribes. But the judge that Jesus describes in this parable was not up to par did not live up to the standards, but this was the judge in power. This was the judge in power over this widow, over God's people. And then after that, Jesus describes a widow. A widow was one of the most vulnerable classes of people in the ancient world. And the fact that she goes alone before the judge day after day shows that she didn't have the resources to bribe the judge that she didn't have uh, even a man in her family, a man in her life to represent her or to advocate for her. She had to go alone. And we don't know the details of the case. We don't know what her adversary has done against her, but we know that she is asking for justice, that she has been wronged, that she has been hurt and, and, and disadvantaged or wounded, and she is asking for justice before this judge. But the judge refuses her. He dismisses her case. And instead of just returning home in defeat, this widow goes back and pleads her case again. And he casts her out again and back and forth. Day after day, there is this exchange of this widow pleading and petitioning for justice. And the judge saying, no, no, no. Until finally, he relents. And he actually explains why. He says, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. The widow has won. Not because the judge had a change of heart. Not because the judge became more godly or more righteous or understood his calling. He said it himself. He still didn't fear God. He still didn't respect men. But the widow won because she wore him out. She kept persisting in her pursuit of justice. And the judge finally just tapped out. He'd had enough. Right? He didn't want to see her again. And so he gave her justice. In the New York Times, there was a story of an elderly Korean woman who lived in a small town about 100 miles outside of Seoul. And in her old age, she made it a personal goal to get her driver's license. She had never had one. She'd never been able to drive a car. And in her 60s, she realized she wanted to get her driver's license. She always envied people who could drive. But here was a problem. Um, this, This elderly woman, she was illiterate. And she was uneducated. And so she kept failing the written portion of the test over and over again. 
Finally, after 960 attempts, she passed and got her driver's license. 959 times she failed her written driver's license test. And on the 960th test, she passed. After 700 attempts, this grandma actually became a national story. Okay, word about her spread, and she had a whole country like rooting for her. But even then, she failed another 265 times, or 259 times. And when she finally passed her driver's license exam, uh, Kia, the auto company, they gifted her a free car in congratulations. The whole town was elated. Korea was just putting her on a pedestal as a symbol of grit and determination and persistence and saying that is the Korean spirit. That's how, that's how our country has flourished and survived and gotten to where we are. It's an amazing story. And certainly there are times when persistence and hard work pays off. But that is actually not Jesus' point in this story. He's not saying, pray, 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 and you'll finally get your way. And it's sad that people interpret it that way. That they take this parable and they think that, yeah, we can just pray ourselves. We can pray our way into the kingdom of God and pray our way into getting what we want. That if we pray hard and if we pray often, as we pray with persistence, we will get everything that we desire. That is not the point of Jesus' parable. You see, there's a third character in Jesus' parable, and it's our Father in heaven. And unlike the unrighteous judge, our God is just. Unlike the callous judge who does not respect people, God cares for his people. He loves his people. So Jesus uses an argument of comparison from lesser to greater in this parable to make his point. And he says, will God not give justice to his elect? If even an unrighteous judge will finally give a widow, a powerless widow judges, uh, justice, how much more, how much more will a just, a good, a gracious God give to his beloved people? That's the argument that Jesus is making. You see, church, the nature of petitionary prayer, it's focused on making an appeal to a just God in light of an unjust world. The focus is upon God and who he is. And it's making our prayers and our uh, our petitions and our appeals before a just God in light of an unjust world. And so it's not about praying yourself into health and wealth. It's not about praying your kids into Harvard, Stanford, and USC. And it's not about beating ourselves up because we're not praying hard enough or or feeling guilty because we're not praying with enough fervency or sincerity or regularity. Many of us have guilt-ridden prayer lives for the wrong reasons, for the wrong reasons. Petitionary prayer is about praying the kingdom of God to break in, praying that the kingdom of God would break into the kingdom of this world. David Wells, a uh, professor at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, uh, he wrote an amazing article uh, on this parable and petitionary prayer. And I just want to share a quote with you from that article. Petitionary prayer is in essence rebellion. Rebellion against the world in its fallenness, the absolute and undying refusal to accept as normal what is pervasively abnormal. As such, it is itself an expression of the unbridgeable chasm that separates good from evil. The declaration that evil is not a variation on good, but it's its antithesis. Okay. Petitionary prayer happens when you and I refuse to respect this, uh, accept the status quo, when we refuse to strike a truce with all that is wrong with the world, when we refuse to ignore injustice, but rather speak out against it, rather rebel against it. I want to share one more quote from David's article, as if I'm friends with him, David, yeah. Um, He writes, but... We have lost our anger. 
We've lost our anger both at the level of social witness and before God in prayer. Fortunately, God has not lost his. For the wrath of God is his opposition to what is wrong. Friends, have you lost your anger? Have you lost your zeal? Yes, we've prayed for change, but with no different a tone than we pray for the well-being of our friends and family. With no different a heart or a posture than we might pray for our, our food before we eat it. Have we lost our anger, our zeal, our holy and righteous indignation with this world before a holy God. This is how we are to express petitionary prayer, though, with a holy anger when we see and experience injustice, with a spirit of rebellion against this world and against its systems, and with an unshakable trust that God is just and that he stands in absolute opposition to evil. And that in his sovereignty and in his power, he is going to and he does something against it. He has done it in the past for his people throughout the scriptures. He accomplished victory through his son Jesus Christ on the cross. And he promises a victory to come. We must have this unshakable trust in the person of God and in the promises of God. We express petitionary prayer without losing heart as we cry out to our God day and night. We must express this, this, this heart and passion of prayer with faith, knowing that our God is just and he will surely, absolutely grant justice for his people. Now, I've been talking to a lot of people a lot of people from all sides regarding the things that have have been going on in our country, regarding race and justice, protesting and rioting, white privilege, uh, systemic injustice, police reform, et cetera, and et cetera. I'm texting people late into the night. Uh, My wife, Alice, is annoyed. She's like, get off your phone. I'm like, this is important. My thumbs are getting sore. My phone is getting hot in my hands. And and, and, and through all of these, um, this dialogue, and all of the things that I'm reading online and the books that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm researching, I understand that everyone has different takes. I understand that everyone has different opinions and perspectives on the issues, okay? I, I, I've seen that and I'm trying to empathize and, and see things from all these different perspectives. But there is one thing that everyone agrees upon and it's that we have serious problems in the world, okay? Nobody is dismissive of the fact that our world is broken and that we are in the midst of one of the most difficult and divided times that we've ever seen in in, in our personal lifetimes, okay? In our personal lifetimes. Racism is real. Whether it is primarily personal or corporate, racism is real. Injustice and inequity is rampant. It is plaguing our society. People are hurting and filled with hate and anger and self-righteousness. And I want to exhort you today from whatever camp or tribe that you might identify with or find yourself in, I want to exhort you today as a follower of Jesus Christ to take up the call of petitionary prayer. You see, if you believe that the fundamental issue undergirding the suffering of our black community is systemic injustice and systemic racism, then pray. Then pray. Petition our God like the widow petitioned that unrighteous judge. Refuse to accept the evils in our society. Refuse to accept the status quo. Pray for our leaders. Pray for our peacekeepers. Pray for our protectors and our law enforcement. Pray and intercede on their behalf. If you believe that the fundamental issues are are, are black-on-black crime and violent communities, if you feel like the, the fundamental issues is the disintegration of the black family, 
then I wanna ask you to do more than just identify that as the cause. I wanna ask you to take up the call to pray, to petition on their behalf, to pray and intercede that God would bring peace to violent communities, to petition our God for the restoration of families, of black families in underprivileged areas, to not only pray for your children, but to pray for their children, to not only pray for your household, but their households. If you identify those as the core issues that are being destructive amongst black communities, then pray to petition our God day and night that he might bring healing to our broken land. Now, some of you may be thinking, I can't do that. Mike, I'm not a prayer warrior. Never have been, probably never will be. I'm not really a a passionate person. I'm low key, right? I'm even keel. I'm not an activist. I'm not an advocate, okay? But I wanna tell you, you can be. You can petition for others. And I actually want to say that that if you're an Asian American watching this sermon, that many of us are actually more wired to fight for others than we are wired to fight for ourselves. You see, when, when, when someone wrongs us, if we can, we try to absorb it. I mean, Jesus says, turn the other cheek, but, but for the most part, a lot of Asian Americans, a lot of people, we don't want problems. And so growing up, I would, I would uh, yeah, walk around the mall and, and I would get racist comments from blacks, browns, and whites. But I never wanted to fight, and granted, because I'm, you know, five foot seven and, yeah, anyways, so I'd probably lose. Uh, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't issue any complaints uh, with my school or teachers when my nickname in junior high was Chinko. Right? That, that was my nickname. I, I allowed my friends to label me a racist nickname because I just wanted their acceptance. But you know who wouldn't have accepted that if they had known? My parents. My parents would not have tolerated that. For me to walk around my school and have all of my white friends say, hey, Chinko, what's up? Hey, Chinko, do you want to hang out? That would not be okay. That was okay for me. But that was not okay. That would not be okay for my parents. You see, when someone wrongs us, yeah, we are willing to absorb it. Culturally, if you're Asian, we're raised to be rule followers. We respect hierarchy. We ourselves don't levy complaints to our deans, to our bosses. We're we're, we're tentative about going to HR in our workplaces. If you're an immigrant, you know how to keep your head down and assimilate to a dominant culture. We know that adage, the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. But, but, when your children are wronged, you're not okay with it. When your children are wronged, you're not okay with it. That tiger mom is going to come out and you will fight on their behalf. I've seen it. I've heard stories of of moms, of Korean American moms advocating regularly, passionately on behalf of their children to receive equal opportunities in their school systems. Young adults, college students, you may be able to absorb wrong, but how would you react? How have you reacted when your parents have been wronged? When your parents have been wounded? When your parents have been oppressed or hurt? You're angered. You are angered and that is not okay with you and so you become an advocate you will go and find a lawyer on your parents' behalf. You will make that police report and file it on their behalf because you know that that is not okay. When your friends are hurt, you will stand up for them and you will demand justice. And so this is, this is kind of our Asian American experience. We might be willing to absorb, but on behalf of others, we will fight. We will advocate and this is actually one of the great strengths about, from, about, uh, that, that come from coming from a uh, collectivist society. We empathize with others. We deeply share in the suffering of others. We don't just treat people or family members as individuals or community members as individuals. We say our people, our church, our community. Right? Brothers and sisters, I believe that the way forward 
for the Asian American church. For us to truly be salt and light, not only to one another as fellow Asian Americans in this small little tribe, but to really be salt and light to our local community, to the city of Los Angeles and to the world, is to love others as we love ourselves. To love others as we love our children. To love others as we love our own parents. To see the white, black, and brown communities in our country, not as categories of them, but as categories of ours. Why? Because we are all made in the image of God. As fellow image bearers of God, we are called to have a sense of responsibility, a a, a sense of, of, of duty and care and concern and love for them. And if we can begin to do that, if we can begin to see white, black, and brown communities as our people, born and made in the image of God, then perhaps we can pray. Perhaps we can advocate. Perhaps we can love them in a way that reflects the love of Jesus. Let me close with our final point, the power of petitionary prayer. And the power of petitionary prayer lies in not the people who pray. It doesn't lie in us who pray, but in the one who hears. The power of petitionary prayer, it lies in the one who hears. Friends, all of God's promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And this includes God's promises to grant justice on behalf of his people. My friend uh, Eugene Park, who pastors up in Silicon Valley, he wrote a great article for the Gospel Coalition titled Prayer as Activism. Prayer is activism. It's a form of activism. And I want to share one quote that really impacted me. He said this. He said, Our apathy about prayer and our rush to do justice in any number of other ways rather than pray may uncover not a disbelief in prayer itself, but a failure to see God as judge. Our failure to see God as judge. A failure for us to trust that vengeance is the Lord's. A failure to trust that God will surely grant justice for his people. And the way that God will enact justice for his people in our world is through the establishment of his kingdom. The kingdom of God, it is his reign, it's his rule over his people and in his world. The kingdom of God was inaugurated in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. It is present and active in the world today through the church and through his people. And it will be consummated, it will be fulfilled when Jesus Christ returns. And this return, this coming kingdom, it will come like a thief in the night. Brothers and sisters, the kingdom of God is a gift for us. It's something that you and I receive, not by works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And when you and I trust in Jesus, in his life, death, and resurrection, what that gives us, what that allows us to experience is this transfer of our identity, this transfer of our citizenship out of this world and into the kingdom of God. No longer will we reign over our lives. No longer will this world or the rulers of this world reign over us, but instead, when you and I receive the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Jesus, he becomes our king. He becomes our righteous Lord. And that is such good news. Friends, if you have not experienced this, the reign of Jesus in your life, I want to encourage you to receive it today right now. If you realize that that you lording over your own life has done you no good. If you realize that that trusting in the leaders of our cities, our state, and in our nation, that has done you no good. And you are looking for a better leader, a better king, a greater Lord. Would you consider Jesus the King of kings and Lord of lords? He is good. He is mighty. And he is a king who laid down his life for you. He took your place on the cross. And through his death and resurrection, 
he grants us free access, free citizenship into his kingdom. But right now, as followers of Jesus, we live in the tension between two kingdoms. We are citizens of heaven living simultaneously as citizens of this world and our call is to be set apart from this world. Our call, as David Wells reminds us, is to rebel actively from this world. Our call is not to just follow the culture and give in to the culture and say, hey, we can't do anything about it, might as well live in it and assimilate and manage and and flourish in it. No, our call is to subvert the culture, to reject this world's kingdom and to point the world, to point everyone to a greater kingdom, to a greater culture, to a greater king. If you and I are not petitioning for God's kingdom to break into this world, maybe it means that we've actually made our home in this world. We actually love this world too much. We like this world. We're too comfortable in this world. Maybe we have actually made a peace with this world that Jesus Christ never did. And in that truce, And in that truth, I want you to know that we are actually betraying our true king. James writes in chapter four as well, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This is how we are called to live. This is how we are called to pray. An active rebellion and rejection against the kingdoms of this world because we belong to a greater kingdom. We serve a greater king. Friends, what would your life look like? What would your life look like if you lived in protest, not acceptance, but protest and rebellion against this world? When Jesus closes his parable, he asks, when the son of man returns, hence his return, will he find faith on the earth? And up until this sermon, I, 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 just, I thought it was just genuine, general faith. That when Jesus comes back, he's going to be looking for people who trust in Jesus. Who have believed in the gospel. And, and, and yes, and, and just said yes to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's what I thought. But you know what Jesus is actually asking? He's saying, when I return to this world, will I see people living in petition? Praying in petition living in rejection of this world, just as the widow was relentless in seeking justice, will I find in my church, in this world, a people who are relentless in their pursuit of God and in their cries for his kingdom and his justice to come into our world? That's what Jesus is looking for. That's the question that Jesus is asking us today. Will he find it in you? Will he find it in me? Will will we be the kind of people who are willing to truly reject and rebel against this world because we are friends of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We are the beloved of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this timely word for us. We confess that many of us have become cynical and we've lost heart. The problem of injustice, racism, division, all of the noise that has been flooding our media, it's overwhelmed us and we're just giving in. We feel like nothing can change. We feel hopeless. God, we thank you for your word today that calls us not to lose heart, but to be steadfast in prayer. And I pray, Lord, that though the night is dark, though we see so much brokenness in our lives and in this world, help us to lift our eyes to you and to remember that you are coming soon and very soon. And when you come, you will surely right every wrong. That justice will finally prevail and roll down from the mountaintops 
in absolute victory. We long for that day. And until that day comes, may your people, may your bride continue to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, help us here at all nations to be a city on a hill, a light unto the world that is not hidden, but shines brightly and beautifully for your glory and for our good. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. Thank you so much for joining us again uh, for worship. I pray that we would really consider God's word for us today. And uh, one great way to respond is to really um, take up the call to pray. Maybe it's just at the end of this video and the end of the sermon, if you would just go into a quiet place in your home, into a closet and really petition. Petition petition on behalf of, of, of people who are hurt people who are oppressed. Petition for God's justice to be manifest in our world. Would we do this today? Would we do this tomorrow? Would we be the kind of people who do this every day of our lives until Jesus Christ either takes us home or he returns in full glory? Would you receive the blessing of God? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings